Welcome to GP Learners to this session where myself and Andy are going to go through the entire GP contract. So this is the imposed GP contract in its final form and we're going to cover in this episode the GP contract, the PCN DES, all the subsections of that as well including capacity and access, IAF and Quaff as well. This is going to be a mammoth live stream. It will be sectioned down below if you want to check out the comments and stuff for the timestamps once we've finished it and stuff to help navigate it. But let's get cracking as we tech enhance your primary care. <music> Welcome, EGP Leonard. How are we doing there, Andy? Yeah, good. Yeah, a little bit daunted by the task in front of us today to cover <laughs> all of this in roughly an hour. But, uh, but hopefully, looking forward to kind of giving people an overview of yeah. the documents because a lot of these are they, they kind of serve as ref reference documents you're never going to remember the the whole contents but uh, you need to know what's in them so that you can dive in and find answers mm -hmm. when you you need them i guess that's the approach that i take but uh, how are you doing this morning yeah ticking on last few days of ramadan so it's uh, one of the reasons why unlike previous years where myself and andy section off the various different stuff and things we do in separate videos just haven't really had the time to do that this year so we're doing one big stream but as a result uh, like i mentioned earlier do look down in the show notes, particularly if you're looking at this on the YouTube platform where the, most of that will be stored. There'll be links that show you how to navigate to the very relevant sections that you want to check out once we finish the live stream. Give, give me a few hours and stuff and things to sort that out for you. Um, but we have got a huge, and I do mean a huge amount to cover in this final section. So um, just to go through what we are going to go through, so we're going to go through the actual GP contract itself um, and the changes that have happened as a result of this imposed GP contract. We're then going to talk about the PCN DES and the two main sections of that, so section A and section B, which we'll come to in a second. We're then going to talk about the capacity and access funding and the changes to that, which are really relevant for your PCNs and particularly practices, because this is where most of the funding that you're going to be able to get for the 24-25 comes from. The changes to IAF and how to achieve them. Um, then we're going to talk about QOF and absolutely we're going to take all your questions and comments throughout this episode as well including that as well that sounds like a lot doesn't it andy it does sounds like a lot so uh, i guess maybe for about about an hour aren't we and we'll see how we get probably on. we'll try our best to keep it as quick as we can though everyone and for that reason let's get cracking shall we so first thing we're going to talk about is the gp contract itself now myself and andy did briefly cover this last week um but we're just going to go into a tiny bit more detail aren't we andy yeah, and um, it's had a little bit of time to settle as well, hasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if, Gandhi, it might be worth just showing people where they can find all these documents themselves. Yeah. So um, so if you go to you know, NHS England, england.nhs.uk, uh, go to the main website, you click on publications, it, it lands you basically here in this section where you can search for publications. Probably we want to be looking at ones relevant to general practice. Um, and then it does them in reverse date order, really, and they publish quite a, quite a lot. So these yeah. documents we're looking at today today are on sort of page one and page two of the current general practice um, uh, search results. Uh, but that's where that's where you find these ones and you can keep an eye out for things dropping on in that area. Mm -hmm. so, so first thing we're going to cover is the actual adjustments, financial adjustments to the GP contract itself. Um, so this was a letter that came out. It's about four pages long. And like I said, myself and Andy did cover this briefly last week, which is zooming in so you can see that a bit clearer. Um, and basically, this sets out the terms of the imposed GP contract. Key things to look at is the, probably that first table that you can see there that showcases the difference in allocations that come through for the GP contract. Um, I, I guess the key parts that we picked out from this is that there is an increase. Um, says that they've included the DDRB uplift for 23 24, which was that 6% rise that was commented back on in around about October, November, but actually worked out about 2.4%, wasn't it, Andy? Yeah, right. and uh, that was to cover the um, uh, workforce component of the GMS payment. So it wasn't, you know, a 6% uplift to the whole thing, mm -hmm. but if you were giving the relevant employees a 6% uplift in the average practice with average uh, workforce costs, then mm -hmm. this should allow you to make that payment. Um, and of course, that's money that sort of came last year. So I guess it's not necessarily we're going to see any, that increase this April, are we? I think that's included from last year. We were concluding. Yeah. 
Um, definitely. And then they've included some of the other increases that they've put in and whether they're actually increases or not. So the PCN funding for leadership currently in the SDF. So this is money that is allocated to PCNs that was um, at the discretion of ICBs um, to some degree in terms of allocating what they've done is included that within the kind of contracting mechanism to say this money should now go directly to the PCNs themselves, which is in addition to the other funding for leadership and and oh, I forgot what the term was now, Andy. It was, uh, there was leadership and management funding, wasn't there? Yeah. Uh, I think I think some of it was sort of top top sliced and uh, spent at a higher level than PCNs. Mm. Well, that was I think our local experience, but that looks like it's allocated to go directly to PCN. So whether you can count that as a as an actual increase or not, I I, I don't know. <laughs> Realigning the deck chair, shall we say? <laughs> maybe we're not sat on the titanic are we gandhi is that, is that the analogy anyway what you think about this moment in time with the general practice and stuff is it the titanic i don't know um but then in addition to that there is some extra funding they're putting into the iaf which is um specifically around the early cancer diagnosis they are putting an extra five million pounds across the entire contract value so that's all practices and networks um to help with early cancer diagnosis and we will cover that when we get to the iaf section um, and then there's some smaller baseline growth. And basically what that means is that the total value for the GP um, contract has gone up to 11 billion. Million. These are millions. 11,000 yeah. million. So 11 billion. Yeah. In total, um, which is allocated to the general practice out of the total NHS budget of 160, 170 billion. I think it is. Uh, I think it, I think it's about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like we said this is kind of the key financial stuff that people need to be aware of the next paragraph identifies what we just mentioned about the changes in the the leadership funding for the pcns and stuff as well as a, a bit more detail as the actual funding and stuff that comes through yeah reducing Anything... iaf from 36 to to five indicators that'll be apparent mm -hmm. when we look at the iaf section but um there was a drive to they say sort of simplify um mm -hmm. and reduce the bureaucratic bureaucratic burden on general practice so there's a reduction in cough indicators and, mm. and iaf so it's explaining really the rationale or the facts behind what what's uh, what's behind those figures essentially yeah and then it talks about the cape funding which we will come to shortly but the key thing is that that's continuing um it's still a 70 30 split in terms of 70 percent straight away for doing the the basic stuff that it mentions um, we'll cover that when we get to that section then the 30 percent the main difference being that the additional 30 percent is uh, available in financial year compared to the 23 24 additional 30 percent which practices will probably start getting in the next month or two um from previous years and stuff and we'll go through the criteria you need to go through in order to achieve that um and then yeah just tying up a few extra things so there's the weight management which is continuing at seven million and the resources to that we mentioned last time around we're not going to go into that in any real detail because it's basically the same thing there's no difference and then they changed to ours which talks about the increase in funding which is basically just a baseline increase of two percent yeah um and obviously the inclusion of the enhanced nurse access role um that's available which um so i've been sent some really helpful information from some egp learners um in particular trying to look at that um we unfortunately aren't going to cover the, that in too much detail but effectively just a reminder enhanced nurses is basically you've got your practice nurses here you've got your there are nps there and you've got your consultant level um nurse practitioners up here and the enhanced one is kind of in between practice nurse and an amp in terms of experience slash qualification slash capabilities and it's more focused on particular areas and, and things so that's kind of our understanding of it feel free to tell us if we're wrong in the chat and the comments yeah and as with anything we've not done the disclaimer have we but you know we're not your icb we don't manage your contract yep. we're not locally interpreting how you're performing to the contracts they always have these discussions with your local mm -hmm. icb about what their expectations are about your delivery and i think with the enhanced nurses i think my my understanding is that it, it was the intention is to allow the employment of nurses to do sort of additional specific things that aren't practice nurses and that aren't um seeing minor illnesses or the sorts of things that amps yeah. would do but are additional sort of in the spirit of the the principle of primary care networks that that, that funding is for additional non-core general practice work so, mm -hmm. so that was my interpretation yeah pretty much agree with that 
And then pretty much it talks just mainly about the Rs reimbursement from there on, wasn't it, Andy? I can't remember there being much else. Yeah, there. absolutely. And um, there's flexibility. Re they've removed the um, uh, caps on yeah. roles, I gather. Um, and there was the addition of the enhanced. Was there any other en any other additional um, roles? There was the enhanced nurses. No. Um, yeah, we I think we covered that in more detail previously. So that was the letter, um, essentially. Mm -hmm. So... So next thing we're going to talk about is, um, I guess, what does that mean? So obviously we, we talked about the changes to the GP contract that have come through. So there's the 2% overall uplift um, that came through. There is some of the minor changes in terms of um, data sharing agreements and various other things. I would highly recommend go back and look at our previous episode where we covered all of that. But one of the, the things that we wanted to talk about now was more specifically, it was the changes around the PCN DES itself and go through what that actually means for practices. Because the key thing with the PCN DES is that's where all the additional funding seems to have gone through for practices, which also includes the capacity access improvement funding, as well as the IAF. And then we'll go to QOF after that. So, shall we start with the PCN DES, Andy? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good place to start. So, um, so how the PCN DES is structured has changed this year. So previously we, we had sort of one, uh, large document. So this is the document from last year. And within that, um, it provided uh, sort of sections to look at the, um, so section eight is a big section that's changed. So that's the section that looked at the service requirements. And there were quite a number of things in section eight within the main mm. document. Let's just remind ourselves, gosh, so much text to scroll, scroll through. <laughs> yeah, mm. so there was the uh, SMRs, medication reviews, meds optimization work. There was the enhanced health and care homes um, work and specifications in there. There was the early cancer diagnosis work. There was social prescribing. There was specific uh, requirements around cardiovascular disease prevention, um, ta tackling neighborhood health inequalities, anticipated care, personalized care were in there. So the contracts changed. So they sort of said they're simplifying things. So this contract weighed in at um, about 115 pages um so there's a new main contract uh that weighs in about 120 pages and then there are two um guidance packages that mm -hmm. are uh, so there's part a looking at the clinical requirements and it's guidance for implementation so i think when we get to that i think we can interpret that as guidance rather than mm -hmm. specifications that's my interpretation um and then there's part b which is guidance around the non-clinical implementation of the contract and so the, the total of everything now is 206 pages so um sort of simplified to 206 pages um yeah. <laughs> so so that that's it so that's interesting well that's the um, nhs isn't it for you andy when we simplify things we make them bigger and more bureaucratic yeah although actually the guidance documents are helpful and when we get to them yeah. you'll see that they they actually link out to um resources that might be useful in the implementation of it and you know some, sometimes you know the lack of guidance um is difficult isn't it because there can mm. be disagreements with icbs pcns um about what needs to be done um and there can be disagreement you know or there can be confusion about how to do it so actually some of those yeah. links and resources are really really helpful um so if we look at the content of the main document now this can you just zoom in andy i can yes so Helpfully, if you pick up the new documents, um, they've highlighted bits in in orange or yellow, which I, my highlighting is a slightly different hue of yellow here. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll see the different shades of yellow, which I think are drawing our attention to things where there have been sort of significant changes um, to the wording or the content. Um, as per the previous document, these have largely become, I think, reference documents um, mm -hmm. to me. Um, it's difficult to, uh, you won't remember all of the specific contents, uh, but being familiar with the the content, with the contents pages at least, so that you know what is in them and you can dive in and you can answer questions or queries if you're wondering about how to implement certain things. Um, the PCN DES is largely the manual for running the PCN. So a lot of the information is about how practices sign up and uh, you know yeah. how you should elect your clinical director and you know things like that, which I think have been embedded for a lot of primary care networks now. So just highlighted a few bits that we might want to draw attention to. I think we've already spoken about the changes to the additional roles reimbursement scheme, I think 
the main changes in previous videos mm -hmm. um the service requirements might be worth looking at so it's still section eight but it's a lot shorter now and actually part a provides the guidance for the implementation of this um but they sort of do define the the four key functions of a primary care network, um, which I think is quite interesting. So coordinate, organize, and deploy shared resources to support and improve resilience and care delivery at both PCN and practice level. So there might be a bit of improved sort of clarity about what a PCN is for now, because mm -hmm. it was all things to all people initially. And was it to um, support core general practice? Was it to work on population health management? These things were a little bit unclear. So they do define the core functions. So we've done A, um, B, improve health outcomes for its patients through effective population health management and reducing health inequalities. So that's mm -hmm. up, up there as a main requirement. Um, target resources and efforts in the most effective way to meet patient needs, which includes delivering proactive care. And D, uh, collaborate with non-GP providers to provide better care as a part of an integrated neighbourhood team. So that that's now um, specifically um, detailed in the PCN. Uh, Des. So this is an area, as you can see, with their shade of yellow uh, that has changed uh, somewhat. So um, and then uh, these areas are talked about more. So supporting improving resilience and care delivery and improving health outcomes and reducing health inequalities. They're talked about in part A. Part A is the guidance for this mm -hmm. section um, eight of the contract. I'm just whizzing us back to the top. There's probably a button on this interface that takes us back to the contents page, but I, I can't find it. Um, and then there's the network financial entitlements as well, which, again, there's a, a handy table um, that just highlights where these have changed. I think we've already talked uh, to these, but it just highlights the um, the headline levels of funding that mm -hmm. are now available in terms of core funding uh, per patient the enhanced access payments, the care home premiums, which remains at £120 uh, per bed, um, and the capacity and access uh, payments as well. So if we just go back up to the top of that table, um, so yeah. I think probably worth us just covering that in detail so people are aware of it. Um, so uh, it's obviously based on April 1st, uh, 24 to 31st of March 25, £2.916 £2 per patient with two point two one eight pounds multiplied by the res, res size, registered list size from the 1st of January 24 and 0.896 pounds multiplied by PCN adjusted population as of 1st of January 24 and this combines the funding that previously they had as core funding and director payments and leadership and management payments so we mentioned earlier about that 45 44 million and the other funding being rolled into things that makes up the 90 something I can't remember was it 95 no 89 million um in total that is now available to networks directly so basically they've taken the one pound 50 that we got before and added in this extra pot that is now at the network's discretion to use compared to before it was much there was additional stringencies wasn't there yeah yeah so we always use, we always used to think of this as the the one pound 50 we used to talk about um mm -hmm. but obviously as you said that the, the clinical director funding and the leadership and management funding has been rolled in um, and um, that can be used flexibly. So it might be that you need two clinical directors and you, know, mm -hmm. you can now do that within the funding. It might be that you need no clinical director because you've got some strange um, structure, uh, not advocating for that, <laughs> but uh, or, 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 you know, or, or less, less than you had before. And you have the flexibility now to use that funding for other things or other kind of management or leadership posts within the primary care network. So they're trying to increase the, the, the flexibility there. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see anything else on the table worth specifically talking to. Obviously, it's all them people can dig in. Well, the enhanced access wasn't one of the things that was included in the overarching specification. They had to keep that separate because they felt they hadn't uh, had um, enough time to evaluate that as to how it will look. And that continues at £7.674 um, by the adjusted population. Worth remembering there are... Uh, effectively three different population stats that they use when it comes to PCN DARES. So you've got your raw list size, you've got your weighted list size, and now you've also got your adjusted patient list size as well, which is where a lot of the PCN payments come through. Um, and then, uh, as Andy mentioned, you've got your £1.20 per registered care home pay, uh, bed um, in your network for the care home premium, um, which requires the reviews, and it's relevant to those specific code and codes and things. And then it talks about the CAPE funding, which we'll come to in a little bit more detail 
shortly. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, quite a few things in there, isn't there, Andy? Yeah, it's a, it's a big document, but um, as I say, be familiar with what's in it. Know where to find mm. the contents page, and you can dig in and uh, you know find mm. what you find what you need when you when you need it. So um, so th that's the main des, and then it breaks it out into two um, guidance documents, mm -hmm. and they do say say guidance, and within these documents they use words like uh, could and should and can. So it does read like guidance mm -hmm. rather than that these are actual specifications that need to be followed. Um, so part A, um, this supports section eight. And if we look at what's in it, it's, it's, it's broken down into what, you know, what the main requirements are now. So improving health outcomes and reducing health inequalities and targeting resources and efforts effectively. And then it does talk about the enhanced um, access um, mm -hmm. in, in here as well. So if we just move through, so they're being clear that this is, uh, this is guidance. Uh, yeah. Oh, zoom out a little bit. My, it's, it, I've got a huge monitor next to me. So it, if we go too far in, it looks enormous to me. <laughs> um, yeah. So guidance package designed to support the commissioners and PCNs and the practices to do, to do these. So part A and B are guidance packages. Um, it just links this back to the, the four key functions of primary care networks. So that starts to appear um, mm -hmm. in a number of places. We've already spoken about those earlier. So uh, part one is improving health outcomes and reducing health inequalities. So um, it talks about how a PCN can do this in collaboration with, with other parts. And actually, this document ref refers back quite often to the core 20 plus five um, framework for improving. Um, uh, I'm, I've got that queued up to show you somewhere, but I've got too uh -huh. many, too many okay. things open. Uh, but for Core, core 20 plus 5 is um, basically the um, framework for improving um, health outcomes in you know, the adult population. They have a core 20 plus 5 for mm. children as well. Uh, I'm just jigging my screens around. Let's bring this over and uh, core 20 plus 5. So th this will be familiar to people, um, yeah. but it's like improving maternity care, um, severe mental health, illness, SMI, chronic respiratory diseases, improving early cancer diagnosis um, and cardiovascular disease through a focus on hypertensive case finding. Um, and that's the, the core uh, five conditions. And then the, the 20 is a focus on the 20 most um, people uh, living in the sort of 20 percent of most deprived uh, populations or circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. And then the plus is particularly looking at people um, who might be um, disadvantaged or have difficulty accessing care. So um, we could talk about health inclusion groups, so maybe homeless or certain um, ethnic groups. So just showing that, just to in indicate that um, they mentioned this in a few places in the document. So um, they link across to those uh, principles. So mm -hmm. there we go. Um, so it talks about um, how PCNs can work together with their ICB and with um, other parts of the local health economy to um, engage in population health management. Um, it links out to lots of documents about what good population health management looks like um, and how to use data. And they say, um, so should, should consider applying population health management approaches, um, expected to engage proactively with wider partners, including secondary community care, mental health uh, services, ICB, um, and to have data sharing agreements with um, with those organizations to help support this work, um, to have a focus on being data driven and mm -hmm. they provide lots of links to things that can um, help with learning to how to do that effectively and access the right sorts of data. Um, more principles that can be um, applied. Um, they don't necessarily talk about the outcomes. So I think the outcomes are to be agreed, you know, locally in collaboration with those partners in terms mm -hmm. of what that um, what that actually looks like. Um, health inequalities. So we're talking. They're saying that um, they link it back to the dead specification that um, PCN should seek uh, should actively seek to reduce health inequalities across the core network practices in line with guidance and the core twenty plus five approach. So we're linking back um, to that. They talk about collaboration with local communities. Um, again, 
they're suggesting and strongly steering towards focusing on core 20 plus five uh, principles, but they're not stipulating specific outcomes. So I think these are to be agreed in collaboration with PLACE and, and, and ICB. Um, they also um, talk about supporting the CVD prevention and diagnosis efforts. So this is where we've we've got a table that, um, mm -hmm. so to achieve this, there are practical actions and steps that PCNs can. So that's that, uh, you know, um, uh, it could can should language um and they give some tips about how you can improve detection and management of um of cvd um so they talk about is opportunistic um so targeted um case finding for hypertension mm -hmm. so they talk about things like um targeting people who haven't who are in at-risk groups who haven't had contact with practices for some time uh doing bp checks and uh they also do af doing af checks in places that aren't practices or outreach activity so there's guidance and steers to mm -hmm. do this sort of work similarly they're talking about um identifying people with um elevated cholesterol raised lipids or raised lipids that aren't um managed optimally um and a particular focus on identifying people with unidentified familial hypercholesterolemia and there's also a focus on heart failure and they're they're largely talking about encouraging um and supporting practice to use um bmp brain natriuretic peptide uh, mm -hmm in people at risk of heart failure or with suspected heart failure to identify those people get them to have an echo or further um diagnostic tests and start them on their management so that's that so i'll so pause there for a second gandhi any reflections so far so definitely some information there i think like andy mentioned th this is the repackaging of the original cardiovascular DES kind of plan that we talked about almost three years ago, I think it was. Yeah. Um, so there hasn't been any major changes in that respect. So a lot of this was stuff that, you know, networks were already doing as part of IAF and various other things, that obviously, that they've now been reconciled into different pots for the funding for it. But this is now part of the work that networks are either can do or should do. And, and the language does um, adjust to some of that. So, you know, Andy said originally it says can do this, but then if you notice in the table, it went to should part way down as well so yeah being aware of the language i think is important here yeah so it's, it's kind of somewhat conditional language but but networks do need to be doing something in each of these mm. areas that are specified um i guess moving on with a little bit more pace um they, they there's a, a section on early cancer diagnosis so there is a requirement to do something in that area and this talks mm. about how you might do that and it talks about focusing on referral pathways and practices across um, core practices and it talks about improving screening it particularly talks about working with cancer alliances um, and it does say alliances have been allocated funding to support this work so they have been yeah. it says allocated funding to engage with primary care networks and practices to um, to, su to support uh, this activity um, and there is a particular focus on uh, fit tests and uh, colorectal cancer and that's mentioned mm -hmm. here and that's also part of the remaining IIF. Um, so there's lots of um, uh, you know, underlined uh, underlined um, documents and uh, websites and sources of information to really help practices um, implement this. I guess if I was if I was still sort of a CD working in in in, in primary in um, in a primary care network, um, you know, I'd be thinking about um, who I was delegating this work mm -hmm. for the you know, managing a primary connect was so huge now, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. that I think it helps to have a cancer lead or a, um, uh, you know, a lead for cardiovascular or a lead for population health management would probably allow you to, to cover all of these things. Um, what do you think about practically implementing this stuff, Gandhi? What are your thoughts just kind of beginning to digest? Well, uh, as we go through the different cr uh, criteria, I mean, I think it's important that you have some focus on on this aspect and also keep it as part of your PCN meetings themselves as to how you're going to look at it, how you're going to address it. There will probably be some form of return that still comes through. So at the moment, um, every network has, every uh, clinical director and, and their team has to do a return back to NHS to say how they've achieved each of these criteria. We need to see what next year's return looks like, whether it's one big overarching one like this should be or whether it's going to be still individual composite ones that we have to put to a bigger report and stuff um but basically it does need to be on your agenda 
I know from my point of view, a good person to look at for that is Tara, our friend from you know the Business of Healthcare podcast and stuff. And actually, Tara is joining us yeah. apparently, <laughs> yeah, watching us in, in bed and stuff today. And we're going to be seeing Tara in a couple of weeks, actually, at our PCM Plus conference and stuff, where we'll probably be talking about some of this things as well. But um, you know, definitely check out their website. They've got some really great resources for you to look at that give you a reminder of these are the things to look at each quarter you know, each month and stuff to keep track on some of this kind of stuff, as well as tips and, and examples of what other people are doing across various different areas and things. So that's what I would look at to help remind you what you need to be doing if you're a PCN clinical director watching this right now, <laughs> which is, it was like we've got a few. <laughs> Good. Um, so we'll get, just get through the rest of this, yeah. this part A, really highlighting what's in it. The, the structure of it is, um, it, for each section, it sort of makes station, state, it links it back to the DES. So for, for proactive care, the first statement normally says what the PCN must do, and then in quotes, mm. it quotes from the main contract document. Um, so here, with regards to fertility, the DES specification states that PCNs must contribute to the delivery of multidisciplinary proactive care to those complex patients at the greatest risk of deterioration in hospital admission by risk stratifying. Um, and it goes on, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, and then it says to achieve this, PCNs should um so it's, it's how you might go about this um so so here with regards to frailty it's talking about having a mechanism to proactively identify and code uh mm -hmm. patients with frailty so that these people can then be um offered um specific interventions and provided with care plans to reduce their risk of hospital admission and deterioration mm -hmm. for example um and then it talks about structured medication review so this was part of the the previous yeah. section eight in last year's document and and, and much of this is evolved they said they've simplified it but actually there's a lot of things that are um still there um so this talks about um that they must deliver structured medication mm -hmm. use to high risk cohorts so i don't think that's changed particularly and then it talks about how who might be who might what a, it talks about what a, an smr is and who, which particular groups might benefit from an SMR. Um, again, it's linking it to say um, it should also be alert to the needs of communities and individuals at particular risk of health inequalities, e.g. core 20 plus 5 um, and also uh, BAME and uh, learning disability groups. So it's linking mm -hmm. it back to the core 20 plus 5. So that's beginning to feature uh, mm -hmm. much more prominently in the documentation. Um, talks about what an SMR is. So it's useful to have that, that guidance. Um, talks about um, collaboration on, on wider medicines optimization. So that's working with your ICB pharmacists um, and so forth. Uh, talks about um, net zero, uh, talks about STOMP, all of those things that we've been doing over the past few years in addressing uh, polypharmacy. And then social prescribing, that was also part of the old section eight that is here as well. Um, and it, it talks about what social prescribing is and who that should be provided to. And I think most primary care networks are probably putting that in place mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, it, it again has this line into to, to consider core 20 plus five when um, mm -hmm. sort of selecting cohorts who might particularly benefit from SMRs, and not SMRs, sorry, <laughs> social prescribing. Um, uh, and then this is where also you have your details around the enhanced health and care homes. Uh, and sort of reading through this sounded very, very similar to the previous specification around yeah. enhanced um, health and care homes. Do you have a read through yourself? But that sounded um, very, very similar. And then also talking about um, the enhanced access. Um, again, I think that sounded very similar as well to me. Um, and then it just talks about some of the, the, the coding um, to, uh, to use there. So that takes us to the end of part a i don't know if we've got any comments scandy that we want to go to well we, we've had a few so i think we will go to that just before we do that i just want to point out and i did this last time so we've got over 100 people joining us live on a saturday uh, morning so shout out to all of you gp learners who are doing that um because yeah over 100 of you that's amazing <laughs> that really is um but yeah in terms of comments we've had a few so um where are we uh, so Francis Mulhern, uh, let me just make this that way so it's a bit easier. Do you think the DES gives us an indication that PCN will be devolved into integrated neighbourhoods? Will the new funding process for PCNs in the future? Um, mm -hmm. So I think this is what people assumed would happen this year, and it didn't. 
um, that n networks would change into neighborhoods or something like that, mm -hmm. um, potentially. Now, the reason for that is probably because we're anticipating there's going to be an election in the near future, and therefore nobody wants to make any major changes. I, I find it really frustrating that because of that process, everything's kind of stopped, let's be honest. The entire process has stopped itself, and, and that, that's challenging. But yeah, does this mean that we'll be moving more towards integrating neighbourhood teams? Well, in section B, which we'll come to, it does mention one line in there about moving more towards neighbourhood um, working and, and things. So I think this is possibly the direction of travel, um, and that's what PCNs have possibly been created for. Don't know what you think on that, Andy? I think so. I mean, quite how quite how different an integrated neighbourhood team might be from a from a PCN. I, I think that's up for debate, isn't it? I think it's. Mm. Um, I'm not sure there is a uh, a well formed universal idea of what an integrated neighbourhood team is um, at the moment. And people talk about integrated mm. neighbourhood teams and integrated neighbourhood working, and are they the same thing? So, yeah, it's a complicated question. Um, mm. I think I think PCNs will continue to evolve. So I think in a few years time, they will look different. Um, and I think we've seen over the course of the last five years, um, what PCNs delivered has become more complicated and there's more responsibility um, and activity happening at PCN level. So, um, so if that becomes something that we might call a neighborhood team, I think that will happen. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Um, Joseph makes the comment about some CDs are concerned that their funding is no longer in yeah. and practices might argue about their payment. Um, I think it's a valid point, Joseph. I think that comes down to how good the CDs are at communicating with their practices and also how much work they're actually doing for them. I'd argue that the amount of work that clinical directors are doing for the networks it has never been appropriately funded because it's considerably more than what the funding allows. Um, but at the same time, you need to be showing that to your practices as well and, and explaining it to them. So therefore, there's absolutely an element of communication to go through. Does that mean that the practices could determine where that funding goes? And, and like Andy said, maybe you may be in a network that doesn't need a clinical director anymore. Please don't let there be uh, Nottingham City East because <laughs> um, otherwise I'm out of a job. Um, but at the same time, I think it, there is that flexibility that comes through, which is actually quite welcome in some ways of being able to say like so like Andy mentioned, maybe you could have a health inequalities lead for your network, maybe you could have a population healthcare lead for your network. And, and you've now got a bit more flexibility to drive that through with the funding. Um, but yeah, yeah, Andy? yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of there are so there are some primary care networks that have like very different structures to what we might typically uh, conceptualize a primary care network to be, you know, there are primary care networks that share their footprint um, with um, a, you know, that, that are a one practice primary care network, for example, mm -hmm. and it might be that having one clinical director doesn't suit them because they already have a leadership structure in place and they don't need that, but actually they would need delivery leads for different elements of the primary care network. So, so I guess, that, you know, the flexibility is probably welcome. It, it might be that if you if you are doing more than your, you know, allocated one, 1 1.5, you know, uh, days a week that you can advocate for some more funding for the clinical yeah. director as well. You know, the removal of the ring fence might uh, facilitate those discussions as well. Good point. Good point. I'm going to point out clinical directors have not received a pay rise in throughout most of the terms of the contract as well. So just something to consider. Uh, uh, maybe. Maybe yeah, support that from core funding. Maybe. <laughs> uh, John Henderson, do you get a sense that some of the PCN targets don't coordinate well with the QOF targets, example, CHD? It's interesting. I think some of the targets did and some of the targets don't. And, and there has been some disparities between them, particularly when we had the IAF targets previously. I think there was more synergy. That seems to have gone a little bit to the wayside since last year with the CAPE funding coming through and things. Um, but I think it, it does vary, unfortunately. Andy? Um, yeah, I mean, we can probably talk more about that when we get to the when we get to the quaff okay. and we'll have gone through the IAF at that point to to get to, to get everyone on the same page. But mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it's difficult. And then Christine has asked a question about uh, 2.1.11 early cancer working with partners who pharmacies, I think pharmacies is an option, I, I probably see more community services, Macmillan trusts, um, I guess those kind of things when it comes to cancer screening um public health uh, as well um because it's more about trying to encourage patients to involve themselves with the access and, and that kind of thing mm. as well so that that would be my perspective um christina has also come through from another one appendix b 7.2.1 re max entitlement anyone had a notification already for 1424 
I'm not quite sure which notification you mean because I can't remember what line that was. Um, was that about possibly being over your allocated budget? I would think. Appendix B. Seven point two point one. Appendix B seven point two. I'm Let's have right a look at it, shall we? I, I, I'm on it. Appendix B four five six. So it's seven point two point one. 7.2. So it must be within here. So, so it's 7.21. So that's 7.2A, do we think? I yeah, think we're in the wrong place, that. aren't we? Uh, unless it's I. Point I. Effective shared decision making. I think we're in the wrong place. So okay. maybe, maybe we'll maybe we'll come to that. Maybe it's in part B, the uh, possibly clinical guidance Let, if let's you go see. christina yeah just explain that in a bit more detail so we can understand what you mean um apologies <laughs> on that um and yeah so francis last comment uh, and our two percent increase to support all of this is laughable yeah uh, i think many people feel that obviously the increases have not been um commensurate i think to what we probably feel we need and we talked a lot about in the previous episodes as well as i know the bma looking at that in detail as well yeah although, although this is the this is the PCN DES, isn't it? So two percent core yeah. core contract. The the PCN DES is ARS has at least gone up by by two percent, but um, they have simplified some of what the requirements are. Mm. Um, so um, so it's not that the two percent from the core contract is to support this. I guess I'm just uh, being fair to everybody uh, in explaining that. Okay. Uh, so Chris, Christina said it is the the Part B guidance non clinical. So we'll, we'll we'll have a look at the content of that um, next. Um, yep. I'm aware that the timekeeping is a bit dreadful today, Gandhi. So we'll um, we'll try and get to this a bit All quicker. Right, let's go to section B then, shall we? So, hang on. Let's just wait and find this, switch that over. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess, just, yeah. So the, the section B is the non-clinical guidance around the PCN DES contract. And uh, as Andy zooms in, you'll see there's quite a few things that have um, change not as much as I guess you would anticipate normally um well, and I was expecting more but yeah a lot of this is the bread and butter is guidance on the bread and butter of kind of running the yeah. primary care network you know how do you sign up you know how do you re-sign up you know what, what are the criteria for forming a primary care network and you know all of these all of these things really um it's 69 pages um I think we just zoom in on a few areas really so um we talked about how now the clinical director role is more mm -hmm. tightly defined um and this is the the section it's quite it's quite short um essentially um but uh it says who the clinical director should be and and uh, what the requirements are so that's that's interesting do you have any comments about that gandhi or just no uh, there, really? i think was this the part where we mentioned about int working um i can't quite remember where that was um, it's about it's about modern general practice they mentioned because yeah. because um supporting practices to move to modern modern general practice was this concept mm -hmm. that was um came through when the uh, last year's contract was imposed um yeah. around e equality of access uh be that through the telephone be that through an online method or be that walking up to the desk face to face everybody should receive the same uh service and same access and they should yes. receive some sort of which response we'll come into in a on second. the day yeah yeah so, so we're coming to that in a second but um yeah key, key part of the changes is that it's the pcn clinical director's responsibility to make sure that modern general practice um is achieved in their network area yeah so um so that's better defined um it's a reference document isn't it so if you think oh mm. we need to sub subcontract something to um you know to a physio uh, service provider or pharmacy service provider you know how do we go about that this is where all of that guidance is to kind of dig in and and get some more information about it look at the main contract and then there's expanded guidance within this document um mm -hmm. things had changed around the additional roles reimbursement um scheme i think we we've spoken about that already mm -hmm. um in previous videos so it may be that we don't zoom in on that no. um the financial entitlements i mean we've, we've actually had a look at a table there as as well um so maybe I think we it was worth. In there. I think it probably is worth it's just in. looking at it briefly. Yeah. Um, it's it's so, similar information to what we've yeah. we've already covered, I think. But 
Yeah, so just a reminder, if you wanted to look at the full summary of the financial entitlements for the PCN as this is the, the key section. So the one we looked at was just kind of like the overview letter. That this is the full breakdown of what each network should have and is um, allowable to, to um, receive and, and stuff. So worth having a look at that if you're looking at the financial side of it. I think well, there's a ready reckoner, isn't there? Is it worth yeah. talking about the, the ready reckoner at this Probably, point. yeah. So um, I guess with the contractual change, there is a ready reckoner that practices can have access to. This is actually in the GP contract letter container on an HS England's thing. So it's a downloadable Excel form um, that you can see here and basically put in your network and your practice details. And then this will give you a, you know, the, the outputs of what funding you're eligible for and, and all the other kind of things. So this is something that's been provided previously. I, I guess one of the things I would always try and check the data my experience with the ready reckoners from hs england has been they've not always been 100 percent accurate and they don't adjust in year either um so obviously you need to make sure you go back and get the correct correct version as well um but it's a useful document to, to, to plan with and stuff ha yeah. but i think the the key things that we wanted to look at on this section in particular was um one of the big changes that's now been formalized which is the capacity and access payment isn't it andy um so i'm just going to go through this in detail so um some of you will remember that we did the live streams on these previously um a lot of the criteria is still the same i guess the key difference is that for this financial year for 24 25 that's come through is that they have increased the amount of funding that's available for the capacity and access improvement funds um so they've added in an extra and i've forgotten the number andy apologies was it some I can't remember, was it sort of 55 million or something, 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 something like, like that? that. Which uh, is reconciled from the IAF criteria. So IAF has gone down from being six criteria now down to two. Um, and as a result, of that, those funds have been reconciled into the capacity and access improvement funds. It still continues under the 70 30% split. And we'll break down the, those splits in a second. Um, but, but it's important to be aware that this is regular and recurrent funding that's going to come through for the next few months at least we don't know what's going to happen after march 25 uh, but at least for the next year this is funding that will be coming through directly to the practices it works out depending on your population size about fifteen thousand pounds a month that comes through on the 70 percent split um uh i know the, the more specific details there sorry thirteen thousand. yeah for 13, average pcm which i think is probably roughly just under fifty thousand. i think yeah. about forty seven thousand is the average mm -hmm. pcm size um, and then it talks about the local capacity and access improvement payments. So this is the 30% that you may have heard people talk about. A reminder that this part of the funding will be coming to primary care networks in quarter one of 2024, so in the next few months, and that's based off last year's achievements. This year's achievements is payable in year. It's £1.392 uh, £1 um, per registered mm -hmm. education, uh, sorry, adjusted population page patients um, and I worked out that for a 50,000 population practice that's about 69,000 pounds if you were to get all of the 30 percent key things to know about this and, and there's a couple of key points number one you don't have to have achieved everything in order to get the payment it's split into three different parts further um, and yeah and he's just scrolling down to it so there we are. So it's, it's the three criteria of better to the digital telephony, yeah, simpler online exactly. request and faster care navigation. So for the telephony, as long as all of your practices moved over to um, um, better purchasing framework provided telephony routes, then you will get the 10% of, of that. So, you know, what's 30% of 69,000 if you're a 50K population that we're talking about 20K? 20, 20, 30. Is it? 30. 30. No. Yes. No. <laughs> 26. No. Oh, gosh. 23. 23. So, I think you're right. Okay. Yeah. So just to summarize again, assuming you're a 50,000 patient population primary care network, per 10%, you'll roughly get about 23,000 pounds. So for the better digital telephony, if you've done that in year, your primary care clinical director can say that you, that all the practices have done that, you will get. 20, roughly £23,000 for the network. To do the simpler online requests, you have to be providing online consultations towards your patients throughout your core hours. That's a key wording that I know some places are really frustrated with because 
keeping the online consultations open throughout the whole core hours. Many practices are overburdened with the number of requests that are coming through mm. and actually like to switch it off because they just can't cope from a safety perspective. And it is at odds mm. with the safe um, working practices by the BMA to some degree. But also um, you have to have the relevant um, data notice to, to show that you're capturing that information. <clears throat> Um, so that's another 23,000 roughly, if you were to achieve those for all of your practices. And then the final one is faster care navigation and assessment response. Um, and this is based around appropriate care navigation so that there is no disparity between online requests, telephone requests and face-to-face -face requests for um, patient access and stuff as a result of that. So important to remember that that is one of the key criteria for that part. And then also um, there's something about continuity that they're going to bring in. Now, myself and Andy covered this in the original contract review that they were bringing a line of continuity into the contract. We haven't seen the terms of that, but that's where the care navigation response part may come into play. Um, so those are the three criteria for the capacity and access improvement plan. Mm -hmm. Again, this is based on your clinical director saying that the practices have achieved this. And once they've done that, the payment will be made. There is an audit process that's going to happen at some point for some networks. Um, uh, they haven't identified when or how that will work, but it's important to be aware of the fact that that's the um, confirmation process. Um, and Andy's just hovered over the 70% criteria that you have yeah, to do. So I was, I was going to ask Andy, so, because um, this can be used quite flexibly. So what mm -hmm. what what would a practice be doing to sort of indicate, it, it's, pay, it's paid anyway, isn't it? Or it's paid up front mm -hmm. and, and can be used flexibly to support a number of activities. But what sort of things would a, practice or PCN need to be doing to kind of indicate that they deserve the 70%? So um, I think there will be a reconciliation report that probably the pr clinical directors will have to send back to each of the ICBs to say this is what our practice is doing to manage, um, you know, the, the capacity access support payment. Um, so what are you doing to enhance access to your patients? You know, um, have you looked at any data tools or, you know, uh, other types of data to understand the management of flow and, and demand within your practices? Um, and then also um, there's whether or not your practice or your network is engaging in things like the GPIP program, so the general practice, uh, what was it, uh, improvement program, that was it, yeah. yeah. Um, and other similar things as well. So, so there are various different things that you can look at um, in order to do that. I don't think there's a set route or way of doing that as a result of it, um, but it is very much around using data and equivalating that. I, th I think different places will come up with different mm. documents effectively, but I wouldn't be surprised if this basically just fits along to the modern general practice document, because that's what it did last year effectively. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. It feels yeah feels there's more flexibility for that which which is which is welcome. Um, mm -hmm. so. Good. So that's the capacity and access um, improvement plans. If we just scroll down a little bit further, there was what, the IIF. If we yeah, I was going to get the the contents and uh, and jump down that way. Mm -hmm. so, Should we go to the tables, Gandhi? Or was there anything in the blurb that you wanted to? Um, so I mean, IIF is fairly simple to be honest. Yeah. Um, the key thing, just to be aware of it, is that the criteria have reduced. So there's now only two IIF indicators in total. This is fifty-eight points, of which each point is now one hundred ninety-eight pounds. Aside from adjustments based on prevalence and other kind of things, so it may be slightly different as a result. Um, of which uh, thirty-six points was for learning disability reviews in patients over the age of fourteen. Um, and then 22 points was um, for um, cancer referrals. And so specifically for the CANO2, which is lower um, GI referrals accompanied by a fit test. Um, and I think the reason, my understanding is the reason why they kept this in, this is one of the only initiatives they found that's actually reduced outpatient attendance and um, uh, picked up more cancers as a result of it. So it's had, it's one of the only actual IF criteria that's had a significant impact in terms of um, patient care and outpatient um, numbers as a result of it. So that's why they've kept this particular one in. I think the learning disabilities one is an absolutely sensible one to keep in. But the flu-based ones, the other kind of IF criteria, that they've rolled those out because they felt that they weren't as significant, which is interesting. Yeah, and um, as you say, it's really simplified things from, from what IF looked like it was going to be 
um, mm -hmm. a few years ago, which looked really, really complicated. So I think this is one of the things that is really quite welcome in mm -hmm. terms of changes to the contract this year. Um, just wondering the house also included personal care adjustments into the IF criteria. So if you've got patients for some reason can't do a fit test, you can now add those in, which is a new change. So interesting to be aware of that. Just wondering if we just so we have a look at what um, Annex B, oh, there isn't an Annex B uh, here. So I thought this was where uh, Christina was referring to. Um, uh, so it's 7.2.1. 721. Yeah. So that's good. Seven. So just to remind seven, everyone, this was a comment put earlier by Christina. Appendix B, 7.21, max entitlement. Um, so she's saying that we'll be notified of our maximum entitlement and what we can have. Mm. I, I mean, the, most networks are told of what they're allowable. Um, I think the key thing is that there's no significant increase in this. It's a 2% drift increase based on inflation. Um, which is basically, I think that's meant to cover pay increases um, for this financial year, which may be interesting for a lot of our PCN staff when they find out that they've only been going to be giving them a two percent increase because that's all the funding allows. But yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and a lot of these roles were originally kind of pitched at agenda for ta for change sort of pay mm -hmm. scales, but they'll not be getting similar pay increases to people on agenda for change in in other parts of the NHS. I think um, which yeah which might, which might be confusing to some people who um I, I've, I've heard some conversations where people have been have felt that they are on agenda for change but they're mm. not they just started a role whose initial um sort of salary or banding was aligned with agenda for change but the role is not on agenda for change mm. so um some awkward conversations potentially um to be had mm -hmm. hmm. shall we move on to to quaff gandhi yeah, so I guess just well, any reflections on this. There's, we've had some comments. We've had some more comments. I think most of them are around the um, questions that we've had before. Christine has put another one. Anyone got creative ways to meet the online consultations throughout core hours requirements? Concerned about this? I think. How are you doing it? Um, so, yeah, we offer online consultations to our patients. Um, it's not something that unfortunately they seem to use in great deal, which is a bit more of a challenge. Uh, I would love mm -hmm. them to do that. And we're probably looking at how we can encourage patients to do that. My recommendation would absolutely be to go through things like the NHS app. Um, also, there's some really cool tools out there to help you do things like that. I think a lot of the telephony providers will be providing, you know, chatbots and that kind of stuff to help you do those kind of things. Um, I talked about EDAP being a cool tool to help with um, engaging patients with the NHS app as well. Um, I think there's a variety of different things out there that people can look at um, to help with online consultations. I think the issue of keeping it open throughout the entire time practices are open. I, I think there is something about being honest to patients as, as to the capacity the practices have to deal with those requests. And it may be that you have to increase the time frame that you respond to them. Um, so instead of using it for acute demand, you have one route that's acute demand, one route that's routine demand. Um, Modern I general mean, practice says same day though, doesn't it? That's the thing. Uh, well, yeah, you have to give a response. So it's, so, it's some sort of response, even if it's a, we are we are dealing with your query, you know, but mm -hmm. you've got to risk stratify it at least before you you bounce something yeah. like that back, I guess. Um, what we're what we're doing, which sounds like it's similar to fr to Francis, what Francis is doing, mm -hmm. um, is we've got um, we've made it part of the junior doctor's role and allocated the junior doctor some time at the beginning of the day because that's we did an audit and actually that's when the highest numbers per hour of um, e consultations come in at the beginning of the day and then they drop off. But actually, you've had about half of them come in sort of before 10, 11 o'clock, but then mm -hmm. actually the other half come in before five o'clock you know and a few come in after five so we've allocated some more time for the for the um on-call doctor to do them at the end of the day as well sort of being driven by that data from from our audit and of course they come up to about 6 30 and actually those mm -hmm. that come in at about six um and need some uh you know can't be directed to an urgent care provider because they're not that bad but needs to be put from us and actually very few are seeming to fall into that gray area which is reassuring mm -hmm. but that on-call doctor can find themselves in a a sort of sticky spot you know not having the capacity or resources to, to deal with things properly but most of the time people can have a response indicating that they'll get some input the next day or be directed to an urgent care provider so we're actually finding that's less difficult than we anticipated that's mm -hmm. our experience yeah um and anish commenting we have ours open from eight to six um pretty much core majority of the ones you get are before 11 a.m 
and that the evening ones tend to be more admin related as well. So interesting point there. Uh, Mons Huck, uh, there are proactive care codes at the bottom of part A. Is this new related to inequalities? I don't remember what they were, to be honest. So we might have a look at that separately, if that's all right, uh, Mons. Um, but uh, we can have a look at that later, if that's OK. So just before we go to Quaff, um, I'm just going to share something with you that I created in anticipation for, for this stream. So please watch this for a second. So subscribe, make sure you click all the notifications as well as the notify me for the video. It'd be great if you could like it, share it with your colleagues. And then if you want to see more details, click on more down below. And I'm specifically sharing that because we are going to look at the Quaff documents, which you may want to follow across with. So the links to the Quaff document is actually down in the YouTube show notes and stuff, along with the links to all the container letters that we've been talking about in this stream already. And I showed Andy that just before we went live and he was like, when are you going to play that, Gandhi? And then we did. <laughs> so, so, it's very good. Ring that yeah. bell. Yep. Yeah. Please do. Uh, I mean, that's just so that you get aware of all the stuff when we go live and things, because we have changed our schedules a little bit in the past couple of weeks just because of things like Ramadan and stuff. And hopefully that means you can get access to everything as we go along. Anyway, like we said, let's get cracking and talk about Quaff. So um, there are some changes, quite some significant changes to Quaff um, for this financial year. And we're going to talk about those now. I am aware we're at hour through already. So uh, we're going to try and do this as quickly as we can, aren't we, Andy? Yeah, focus on changes, I guess. Cool. So if you zoom in a little bit, first of all, um, the helpful thing with this is that NHS England have basically made all the changes to the Quaff document yellow, so you can find all the key changes and stuff. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of yellow on this document. However, there is a reason for that and a really simple reason for that as well. Um, any ideas why that might be, Andy? What, why they've made the changes yellow? or No, no, why there's quite a lot of yellow. Uh, there's been a lot of changes. I'm not quite sure what you're driving at, Gandhi. What are you, what are you driving so at? The main reason why that there is actually quite a lot of yellow and, and suggestion of a lot of changes is because they have basically frozen a lot of the indicators. Okay. Um, and as a result of that, there's quite a lot of stuff in here. So the problem with that is it makes reading the whole document a little bit noisy as a result of it and stuff. But effectively, most of the changes are not really changes. It, it's just telling you that it's been frozen as a result of it. And it's uh, identifying that the that particularly the register based stuff of which I think was 33 in total, I want to say. Um, best place to go, Andy, is section 2.1 on page six. Protected. Okay. Yeah. So this talks about the income protection that we've got. So 212 points out of the 568, I want to say. Um, are now income protected. Am I right with that? Yeah, I'm going to tell me I'm wrong I think, there. I think so. Yeah. So what does income protection mean? Well, this extends from previous income protection. Last year, some of these indicators were protected. They've increased that, as we said, to 32 total um, um, uh, 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 indicators. Um, in terms of income protection, what it means is that whatever you've achieved in 23, 24, that's what you'll be paid for 24 25. so that could be a pro that could be a con as well so if you did nothing um potentially that's a pro although you still have to upkeep the registers because the registers helps to include the prevalence which then has an impact on the prevalence payment that enhances the amount that you get um however if you to significantly increase achievement in some of the quaff um, domains and stuff then that won't be paid for extra so it's a it's a swings and roundabouts kind of situation, isn't it, Andy? Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I'm following. <laughs> okay. The other thing to remember, and, and this is where I think a lot of practice managers and business managers will be focusing on, that even though it says it's protected, that doesn't mean you'll get the same amount as last year. What it does mean is the level has been protected. So again, if your prevalence levels or list size changes, that will affect the actual payment you get. So it may still be different but the level of payment should be similar or identical. It also mentions in this section what happens if you merge with a practice or if you lose patients, you know, close a practice, et cetera. 
effectively they'll try and adjust it as best as they can and they will offer the higher payment depending on which one that is outside of local situations which they will then probably have to speak to your icb about if it's more complicated than that and that's about it in terms of the income protection side of things there are however some changes note worth noting for so they have included um quaff codes for ambulatory blood pressure um in the bp reading ones so that's become more relevant for the hyper i think it's the hypertension ones hypertension. so that is somewhere in there about um ambulatory blood pressure readings now being incorporated in terms of um the quaff guidance um and then the biggest change is actually i believe cholesterol management ones and they let's, sorry let's, i'm getting you to jump around aren't i you are You've got Apologies. your own separate notes here, Gandhi. So. I have, yeah. Uh, so, so I basically looked at this whilst Andy was doing the PCN DES ones PCN in more one. detail and stuff. So yeah, the cholesterol management ones. This is probably where there's the biggest amount of yellow stuff. Um, so what they've done is they changed COL1 and COL2 to COL3 and COL4. Um, effectively, the, I'm not quite sure why they've changed the numbers of them, but I guess it's because they made a significant change. The biggest one being on COL04 which now it allows for the inclusion of LDL cholesterol levels because some places didn't have non HDL levels. And also they've changed the relevant criteria to being um, 12, um, sorry, 2.0, which is a slight increase from 1.8, which is what it was last year. And that's to bring it more in line with the nice guidance in terms of achievement. Mm. I believe the level of achievement rates has not changed. Um, so coal three is still 70 to 85% for the achievement points and coal four is 20 to 35% um, in terms of achievements and stuff. Yeah, I think I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and that is pretty much it, to be honest. Like I said, there wasn't any major other changes when it came to Quaff on a significant level. They have um, income protected the Quaff QI so they have stated that you don't have to do the quaff QI, although they would encourage you to still do QI as a process within the practices. Yeah. And most of the other changes that go through are just nomenclature changes or changes to state that it's been protected or just changes in terms of terms and stuff. Um, the depression um, monitoring is included in that income protection. So the requirement yeah. to review patients to to eight weeks after initiation of a uh, diagnosis of depression is not something that'll be quaff managed any further mm -hmm. but obviously from a safety perspective they would still recommend that you do that now i would highly recommend that you still do that because it's depending on the patient's risks and stuff and things but just those are some of the extra non um register based ones that have been included in the quaff and things hmm. does that help andy it does. It's one of those where I, I I'm going to still need to spend some more time um, mm -hmm. just sort of digesting the changes. Um, and uh, the main the main contact I have with Quaff is in the um, is actually within System One, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so it may be that I have to really see it there to fully understand the changes. Of course, they don't update for often a few a few months into the year, yep. uh, which is always really really difficult. Um, so yeah we got through quaff a bit quicker than i was planning andy <laughs> than i was anticipating um, well uh, i think it reflects the fact that there haven't been a, although there have been some changes and some potentially quite useful ones as well it's not been as far reaching as i think people are uh, were originally worried about and stuff and it's things, more the so. income protection isn't it that was the it is. that was that was the biggest that was the mm -hmm. biggest bit um does one of these tables indicate or just all of those that are income protected together is that uh, it's in more, it, yeah, there is a section that shows it. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. I think this is the table, isn't it? So, cause as ever with these documents, I tend to, to try and scan through for the, for the tables in terms of, um, finding the most useful information summarized from the document. So I think we think that these are the paused indicators here. It's in, it's in the indicator yeah. section so pages eight nine ten and 11. eleven um and then the clinical domain ones it includes as well is on um, 11 12 and yeah. 13 i think it was wasn't it yeah good so right what are your overall mm -hmm. impressions gandhi in terms of um contract changes 
either and core contract and and PCN des. Um, we had some initial responses last time, didn't we? We've yeah, it sat with us for a while, and we've had a, a closer look at at the contracts. What are your thoughts? Well, I think the key thing is there are some reconciliation changes that I think are useful from a bureaucratic point of view. I think that, you know, the income protection for QAF is somewhat a benefit. I, th I think it does raise the question, what happens if you manage more um, and the fact that you'll be penalised by if you do better? I don't like that prospect, but I guess it's the only way that an interest in them felt that they could manage the whole thing to make it fairer to everybody else. Um, I think there is something to recognise, though, but because people's attention may not be on as much as quaff what will that mean in the following year because i know in some places where they've had income protection for quaff in previous years because they've not focused as much on having to keep the registers and everything else up now that they're being income protected this year they're actually going to get less than they would have done if they'd still kept it up if that makes sense yeah because the registers yeah, if the indicators are coming back, you still need to maintain the systems and processes within the practice that you use to achieve them, don't you? And if you mm -hmm. let those degrade, then you're not going to be able to achieve them in the future. So I think pausing is is helpful where there's kind of perhaps factors out, outside of the practice which mm -hmm. are going to affect achievement. Um, so the pandemic was a really, really good example you know, mm -hmm. of, of where pausing, I think, was helpful to protect practice income but if you're just pausing them with the prospect of them coming back people will still have to do that work to maintain the ability to be able to achieve the indicators in the in the future so it i think it is helpful but i, I don't think we're dealing with sort of population factors that are preventing the achievement mm -hmm. i think what we're trying to control are um pressures on and within organizations at achieving the outcomes and I, i'm not sure that pausing is, is the best way to do that although i think it is helpful mm -hmm. I think in terms of the PCN DES contract, so we've seen some changes. Obviously, the main focus is now on modern general practice and the CAPE funding to focus a lot of that. The reconciliation, I think, of the DES outcomes themselves, somewhat nicer. Um, I'd be interested to know what the reporting mechanism for that will look like, because I'm sure we'll be told at some point or instructed or demanded, shall we say, in terms of what to do. Um, I think the GP contract we, we talked about in great depth uh, in terms of some of the other changes that have come through. Obviously, the fact that the two percent increase is is a it's just really poor. That, that that's the headline, isn't it? I think yeah. because other things within the within both of these contracts are actually fairly sensible and, and not mm. that much different from what's happened in years before. Um, but it's just that the, the core contract funding increase is just insufficient to cover rising core costs and that's the that, that that's the headline and there's no there's no getting around that really i think perhaps mm -hmm. and they've tried to be quite creative within the cost envelope that the government may have given them but um the cost envelope just ain't ain't right really um yeah. and it needs to be more if people are expecting the same level of care to continue in an environment where the cost of providing a certain level of care is is going up and the funding isn't going up to, to match it um mm -hmm. yeah i guess my overall impression scan i think I think um, so. They've paused some of the quaff indicators, but they have reduced the number of IAF indicators and made that um, simpler. Um, and it's a lot simpler than it was looking a few years ago when that first came down. So I think they are trying to cut kind of that that, that bureaucracy for mm -hmm. primary networks and practices. Um, they've been clearer um, and simplified some of the way that the cash flows, I guess, in terms of. Um, uh, combining a few pots with primary care networks to allow some more flexibility and it's clearer that the CAPE funding will, um, will you know, will flow, uh, the 30% mm -hmm. will flow throughout the year once you meet those criteria. Um, there is more flexibility in terms of how you can use your R staff. They've reduced the, the caps, they've increased, they've um, brought in the enhanced nurse role, not enhanced GPs or whatever they, they you know, they no. might have done to allow GPs to be um, provided as additional workforce uh, they haven't done that but there is more flexibility around how you use that ours money and and maybe that sets a direction of travel for even more flexibility next year mm -hmm. which i think would be welcome um and uh the that's, i'm probably running dry there but mm -hmm. there are some there are some positives but i think it's just that the, the headline funding um isn't sufficient really um have we had a few more comments from people 
How we have. Um, so from a random Facebook user, we've had a comment about um, are the cholesterol indicators allowing for patients with frailty? Do we need to add personalized care adjustments for those patients with aggressive lipid lowering is not indicated? As I said, they have included um, uh, personalized care adjustments in the cholesterol quaff um, this year. So um, maybe worth having a look at those in more detail to see what that means to, to your population and stuff. But I think there is some inclusion in there about in, invite um, how aggressive you need to be and if it's appropriate to do so similar how there is i guess for the blood pressure one in terms of them being on maximum tolerated therapy maybe the right way to think about it um francis again does anyone know anything fancy with registers like osteoporosis rheumatoid arthritis i get my splws to send texts and links with local information and charity and support i think that's quite a sensible thing to do using the you know pcn roles to support the way that you signpost patients to various different services and things I don't know if there's anything else you could think of, Andy. Um, um, I mean, there's all sorts of things that you that you could do. Um, personally, we, we're, we're not doing any things like what have been suggested for those population mm -hmm. groups. Um, I mean, what we have started doing is um, is sending sort of targeted texts to not quite the same thing, but to say people who haven't seen the GP for two years. Um, we don't have an up to date blood pressure reading. Um, you know, saying actually we're running an event, um, you know, at, at the local Tesco's in the local market, you know, maybe mm -hmm. come along there and we're having some success there with that sort of targeting. So not quite a quaff registers, um, but um, defining sort of population health led groups mm -hmm. um, to, to get people in and do specific things with. So, hmm. cool. OK, we've had a question from Joseph Hopkins. Can I just go back to Kate and the OC? We would drown if we open them up from four core hours. Presumably, we just decide to forego that 10 percent of the 30 percent if we choose to. Um, yes, there's a simple answer to that. So if you can't say that you can do that, you still have the other option of going for the other two um, aspects of the 30 percent. So you can still get 20 percent. So if you're 50,000 patient population, you still get 46,000 of the Cape. Uh, sorry, the local local uh, something it fun. doesn't have an l in it it's got a, a diff it should have an l in the acronym but it doesn't um yeah i hadn't really thought about it like that actually that it allows you to um selectively not do things but still achieve some of the funding so that's interesting mm -hmm. and i guess it depends on where joseph is sat as well because if you're a practice um then i guess that means if you if you don't do it and the other practice in the primary care network do they can't get their 10 percent funding mm. either because it has to be everyone within the primary care network so so how you feel about that question probably depends on where you sat within um within the primary care network well i think it could make for very interesting primary network meetings because it, like you said if there was one practice that felt they didn't want to do online consultations for that reason and the others did then they're potentially stopping that network from having mm. funding and how that discussion would go would be well, an interesting one for the PCN clinical director to navigate and stuff and things. So yeah, I guess it's part part of what what will be an intentional primary care network to reduce variability of um, mm -hmm. of experience of of access and other elements of the service across primary care networks. And I guess it's mm -hmm. it's it's beginning to to do that. I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Zalan's come with a couple of points. So number one, uh, what does an enhanced nurse mean? So we did cover this earlier. Um, so feel free to go have a look back. But effectively, you've got your practice nurse, you've got your ANP, and it's somewhere in the middle that focuses on specific um, clinical things. Um, and then he comes back with another one about essentially the incentive structure should be also be along for long term multi morbid clinics. As we mentioned, there is something written into the contract about continuity. They haven't outlined what that will look like and how that will be assessed yet. So whether that will have an impact in terms of long-term multimorbid clinics and the use of them and stuff like, is a possibility, I guess. Um, but yeah, worth bearing that in mind. Um, and then Anish, um, uh, you are you not drowning already? Um, total triage is my snorkel. Um, he has written afterwards that I think it's not, not. Um, <laughs> yeah, rather than don't and stuff. Um, which I, I, I guess that's the flip side of it. You know, um, I, I'm very much of the mind that online consultations can be sometimes more effective because at least it gives you an information capture of what the patient wants. And you can navigate that based off the information the patient submitted. Um, so I, I, I do think it's safer from that perspective. <clears throat> but some, you know, it's, how, it's how you manage it is also part of the challenge. Some, although some people would say that um, perhaps uh the the problem is that you know you've only got so many spaces in the car park you know so many mm -hmm. 
so many doctors in providing so many um, appointments safely and um, uh, that when you do something like online consultations and open it up to everybody within core hours you're just sort of putting another another ramp that goes into the car park but there's you're not increasing mm -hmm. the amount of spaces within the car park and that it, it actually gets you better access to that car park but actually in terms of how many people can can use it um it doesn't really change that i've heard people make that argument as as well i think the jury's out really on online consultations um and 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 what the actual impact on demand management is mm -hmm. it does very much vary i think there's various different models as well you can look at there's the obviously the, there's the total triage model and there's various other ones that i think people are looking at and stuff and things but um, there are some really good resources out there if you want to have a look. Uh, obviously, we host a lot of them on EGP Learning as well, if you want to have a look on, on there as well for, for things. Um, but I think if you do want more information, I guess the question is, where do you look? Well, we've got loads coming for you. Um, there is still time if you want to join us remotely for our PCN Plus conference, which is 10 days? Is it 17th of April. Yeah, so, 17th of April. Um, so in unfortunately, in days. person, we are completely booked out, um, fully booked out, in fact, overbooked out, I think. But if you want to join us remotely, where we'll be talking about this as well with Ben and Ben Gallon from the General Practice Podcast and Tara Humphreys from the Business Healthcare Podcast, then feel free to register for that. It is completely free. So bit.ly slash PCM plus 24L, in all in capitals. Um, if you want to have some slightly different type of fun, then come and join myself and Andy for our GP5T7 conference on the 27th of April, and that's in Nottingham. Alternately, you can join remotely as well, which is what most people tend to do, and that's fine because we've only got about seven seats left in the actual conference um, if you want to come face-to-face -face, uh, with us. And I'm hoping to have some interesting games ready for that mm -hmm. session as well, Andy, if I can get them done in time. I'd love to have more people join me for Epic, um, which uh, is going to be released shortly after Ramadan and, and stuff. So interesting um, implementation consultations with fellow GPs. So bit.ly slash Epic uh, apply. You can absolutely get some more details um, on how to apply and stuff through that link and stuff. Um, and I guess the question is, what are we doing next time? Well, I'm sure there'll be something else coming through because we're not actually quite sure. Um, I think it'll be a news update next, yeah. next time. So. And that there's bound to be something happening around contra contracts, industrial action, um, mm -hmm. never a dull moment. Um, uh, same cool. same day access hubs popping up Definitely. somewhere else and uh, all sorts tends to happen, doesn't it? So I am going to answer Zalan's question. So will you two be charging for autographs? No, we don't charge for autographs. So don't worry if you do want I, to come I would, I would I would be delighted if someone asked me for an autograph. Um, yeah. Can we bring up um, Anish's comment? Um, so just going back to the car park, dis dis disabled uh, <laughs> disabled spots only. Everyone else needs to take the train away from the practice. <laughs> I, I like that. To another level. We, we need to come up with a, a better way of describing that analogy. I, I think that could be quite a cool episode, yeah. to be honest, and stuff. But hey-ho. Um, so do let us know what you think about this episode. We really hope you've found it useful and stuff. If you want to check out our early one that goes into more detail about some of the other contract changes, then definitely check out this episode here, which is the original review of that contract letter. Alternately, there's probably more content coming here. And as ever, we'll be here to tech enhance your primary care and learning. We will catch you the next episode.